IT um, Tim Four. He's been there for 27 years, and uh, before that, he did 12 years of consulting. And do you have an introduction? No, you're not. Oh, okay. Trevor. <laughs> Trevor, yeah. Um, Anyways, we're excited he's here. It's here to uh, not only visit the university, but his son is graduating from the MBA program. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, we're looking forward to your talk. Then. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you, yeah. Trevor, and good afternoon. Most of you have met uh, during morning session, and I had very uh, interesting discussion on very topics you are working on. And there are many things in common on which we are also working on. I think we are also excited working together. I think first meeting was uh, with the RTDS group. And we also have RTDS facility. So uh, this talk I decided uh, because it has some historical importance. We had a very severe blackout in 2012, July 13 and 31st, which actually affected 6, 70 million people and on the second day, and the first day was 3.15. So I have arranged my talk in the following manner. I will just tell about our institute and department briefly, and specifically the power group, and give you some idea about what happened on them, those two days, which caused this blackout, and some of the recommendations on which the Synchrophaser Initiative has been launched in India. We are going to big way. And some of the research work which we are carrying out at IT Kranpur. I will cover only two or three topics, but we are working on several topics relevant to the Synchrophaser applications. So dynamic phaser estimation, and then how to avoid unintended operation of distances. Because that was one main culprit in the blackout. <clears throat> this is not only unique to Indian black blackout. I have seen the report of 96 blackout in the US, and 2003 blackout. This is one of the culprit which creates major disturbances in the grid. And then, how to overcome that? Some idea about the wider controller, and then conclude my talk. But in between, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. So, I would like to answer any query you have. So, <coughs> what is this? Is it not changing? No. I don't know. So the next slide is about our institute. <coughs> so our brand name is IIT. You have IIT in Chicago. It's the same IIT, but different. Uh, 1956 to 61, we had five IITs. And our institute located in Kanpur, which is the central part of India, was one of them, which was set up in 1960. And then Kharagpur, Bombay, Delhi, and uh, Madras, and other four islands. Now, as of today, now we have already 16 IITs which are graduating people, and five more have been announced, so we'll have 21 IITs in the country. And we take students after a very tough exam. I think the success rate is 1.1%. You appear in a uh, joint entrance exam. The success rate is very high. So we really get very bright students in graduate. And postgraduate, we mostly are from the other companies. We have 14 departments, uh, out of which there are 12 engineering departments and three sciences departments, which covers maths, physics, chemistry, and Humanities is the fourth one. And almost all the disciplines in engineering uh, we have separate departments. 
The last one which we added is Earth Science, which cuts across the civil engineering, electrical engineering, the physics people. So they work together. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, electrical actually is considered to be the biggest one. And so, out of my memory, I'm just telling you. And it contains about uh, six major areas. Power engineering is one of them. We have control and automation, information systems, which covers the uh, signal processing, communication, and networking. Microelectronics and DLSI is another stream. Photonics, is control These are the six stream we have. But there is no barrier actually. People work. <coughs> the control is enough. I can work to work. The quality Can we do your presentation again? I think it's locked up. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Can I go back to? Then we need to actually put it up on the computer and then open it. That way it won't. Oh, is it from the guy? Yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. So you are using it? Yeah, I think we, we didn't drag it onto the desktop. Oh, you can copy it? So. Yeah. So this Yeah, one. you see. Okay. So the second last. Yeah. You drag it, first drag it onto the desktop. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Now we can. We'll just leave it there. It. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, the top bar there. There we go. All right. Okay. Let go. Thank you for the screen. Okay. Where did we get the full view again? Do you think? Yeah. yeah. So. We have some. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. This okay. is going to work. Yeah. Fine. So okay. <laughs> so okay, that's about our uh, history about our institute. When we started, it was a cons along with consortium of nine U.S. universities. That is how you will find that a lot of culture of U.S. universities are very much there in our IIT Kanpur, and different IITs actually tied up with different countries. Right? Or I did Delhi went for UK universities, then Bombay went for Russia, Russian universities, and so Madras went for German. So this is the size of our institute. And as I told you, this is the about electrical engineering department on the right bottom wall. And this is our power engineering faculty. Five people are there. Uh, in power systems area, including one which uh, this lady works in high voltage. We have an high voltage lab also. And four people are purely in the power systems area, covering almost all the areas of system aspect. And then we have five persons, five faculty members in all electronics area. We have a very strong power electronic group. Four people are in control area, control and automation. And we work together to share most of the students. These are the research facilities with power and uh, control group. We have almost all the simulation softwares in our lab, including your dynamic security assessment tool, uh, power tech, and uh, power world is very much there. We have different version of power world. And then we have real time simulator facility, we have six RAD RTDS and also open RT simulator. We have also set up the synchrophaser lab utilizing these facilities. So were, were both of them gifts? No. They are not Usually they don't coexist. Yes. Actually we wrote the two with different agencies and we got the funding to it. So that is the history. Yeah. So but we are uh, one group is using Open RT and that is using the RTDS facility. We have controllers lab, uh, part of the polytronic facility, and we are also one of the eight institutes which have been named as center of excellence in polytronics. So we got additional funding for setting up this lab. We have intelligent controller and a high lab. 
This is our real-time digital simulator facility, which was set up in 2011, uh, July. And we also acquired Synchrophaser in Cubepoint, so Synchrophaser Lab. So we are also active in smart grid activities. In fact, I'm one of the members of the Ministry of Power, expert committee, who have given 14 smart city pilot project. And we were the, we are the only first institute to get a uh, smart grid project to implement in one So recently we are we are going to work on that. And we also want to set up the center of excellence in smart grid. So another project we have written. Now, uh, little bit background about the synchro phaser. I think most of you, uh, many of you are working in that area. And the history is that the relay group in Virginia Tech actually developed the first synchro phaser. And in 1992 or so, with the help of utilities like BPA and others, they developed first prototype. But real uh, impetus to the application of synchrophaser technology came after 2003 blackout. And in India, actually, it picked up after 2012 blackout. So blackout, in some sense, is born to the power engineering people. So you get a lot of funding to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's no longer true in the United States. We thought so too. But the last time we had a blackout, we all happened to be in Iraq. So oh. all the money went there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, this technology actually is good for dynamic monitoring of the power system, wide area monitoring of the power system. And this forms a part of the smart grid initiative. Uh, this is how the technology is described normally. You have field units which are called as phaser measurement unit, where you bring the field signals in the form of voltage and current analog signals and calculate the fundamental phasor, which is sent to a phasor data concentrator, which time aligns the phasors and then it utilizes for various application software. Let me tell you, the SCADA has done a great job, and it is not competitor of the SCADA system. It is complementary to the SCADA system. People sometimes get confused that this will replace the SCADA system. At least in our country, when we went to the policy makers and utilities, they were quite scared. And the advantage is that all the data you are getting from phaser measurement unit is time stamped, which is synchronized to the GPS clock, having a very high accuracy of microsecond. And you can get at a rate as fast as one phaser per cycle. And in fact, the new standard allows you to go for two phaser per cycle. That is the rate you can get the data from the field. And you can monitor the dynamic situation and also use for various control and production applications. Some detail about phaser measurement unit, which is the field unit. So after you get the analog data, you use some anti-aliasing filter, digitize it, digital filter, and then you use some algorithm similar to DFT or some other technique to estimate the phaser. But this phaser is defined with respect to the fundamental frequency. Fundamental frequency always changes because the frequency is never at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, perfect 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So you have to estimate the actual frequency. So you need frequency estimator and then GPS clock for time stamp. So that's about the phaser measurement unit. Now, new standard actually <coughs> stipulated the performance requirement of dynamic phasers, that is phasor estimation and dynamic variation of system conditions, which is creating a challenge to DFT-based algorithms, although adaptive DFT and other methods have been used. So there is a need to evolve new methods for dynamic phasor estimator. And one of my PhD students actually worked on that. I'll be sharing some of it. And these are the recommended phasor rates. You can pick up one of them depending on the application. Faster application, you go for faster rate. And then it is synchronized to the GPS clock, as I said, 
And why GPS clock? Why not internet clock? Internet clock has a accuracy of milliseconds, whereas GPS clock microsecond. So if there is a inaccuracy up to 26 microsecond in 60 hertz, that itself causes 1% error in phase estimates. So that is why you need very accurate clock. Now, some of the performance uh, requirement which the IEEE standard C37118, which was revised in 2011, brought in two parts. The first part actually described the performance requirements. Total vector error, which is the difference of the actual value and the major value of the phaser. This, in most of the cases, it should not exceed 1%. And then it also defines frequency error, rate of change of frequency error, and the response, the step response requirement in terms of how much delay is allowed, what is the overshoot limit, what is the response time. So if you are developing some algorithm, you have to test to meet these requirements. Now coming back to India, Indian power We have Star capacity as of 31st March this year of 268, close to 268 gigawatt. And you see here uh, the thermal install capacity is as high as 70 percent or 70 plus. We are adding a lot of renewables, but still we are close to 12 percent. And what does that mean? 12 percent capacity total install. Yeah, because usually when we talk about percent of renewable is in terms of energy savings. No, it's not energy. It is yeah. energy. That, that's it's the way we talk about it in North America. Yeah. Yeah. Energy less. Yeah. And then we have three types of ownership. We have like uh, here federal government, the state government, and private owner. So central is federal and state is various states, the utilities are there. So the private sector participation is now growing in India. There was a act which was brought out in 2003, which promotes private participation. So it is growing rapidly. And central, we have central utilities like National Thermal Power Corporation, Hydro Power Corporation. And every state has some utility. Now, despite the install capacity of 268 gigawatt if you see the energy shortage and power shortage it is to the tune of 3.6 percent and 4.7 percent so we are not able to meet the peak demand per capita is quite low 957 i think all most of the developed countries ranges between 15,000 or 25,000. and we have not completed our rural electrification it is still to go and losses are very high in our country. Because the way that you define them. The distribution losses are rather high. And it is in the terms of the non recovery of the So, yeah, it's, 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 it's the people system. who are not paying for electricity, no, those are called system. losses. Yeah. But so, we don't define them then. No, we call it aggregate technical and power systems. So, that is the deficit degree. And this is our whole country is divided into five regions actually for better coordination uh, northern region, south, east, west, and we have northeast. If you see the map, I mean, this is look, shown as disjoint, it is actually continuous plane. Uh, this side we have Bangladesh, this is Nepal, this side we have Pakistan, and here we have Sri Lanka. And each region has different types of resources, like north and northeast has hydro dominance, western and eastern have coal, and southern also has some amount of coal. Uh, the loads in northern and western region are quite high. Eastern has less load. So there is a need to transfer power from one region to the other, depending on the season and availability of the fuel. So we have gone for DC interconnection as well as AC interconnections uh, for inter-regional connections. This is the size of transmission network. So if you count 220 kV and above, we have about 313,000 circuit kilometer of transmission line. 
I would say transfer sirloin is quite well managed in our country. The losses are also reasonable, three to four percent. These are the renewables. Renewable actually is growing fast. Uh, we have a lot of wind uh, power plants located in southern side and western side, about 23,000 plus uh, megawatt. Solar as of now is only 3,700 megawatt. But our government has announced that in coming five years we are going to have 100 gigawatt. I don't know who gave them advice, but it is coming. <laughs> I thought there is a zero mistake. The fact is that they announced 100 gigawatt and. Yeah. Oh, so the, I said this, I see onshore potential there is only 50,000 megawatts. So that seems kind of low. Which is known, known uh, site. Oh, known size, site. There are certain sites which are not known. And they are still to be exploited. Yeah. And offshore, we have not gone for yet. We have to go for Okay, so that's about renewables, and as I told you, we have we have divided into five regions. So five regional load dispatch centers are there. We have a national load dispatch center, and every state has a state load dispatch center. And these regional and nationals are managed by an independent company known as Power System Operation Company. So we have two exchange in operation. Although the level of uh, uh, power which is being traded in the exchange is very low, about 5% or so. We have a very peculiar mechanism, which is not there in any other country. It is frequency linked availability based tariff to bring the frequency within limit. Physical controllers are missing. Even primary governors were bypassed earlier. Now there is a strict regulation that primary governor has to be connected. And the how to bring the frequency closer to the nominal value, there is some incentive or disincentive given through this mechanism. So we'll just quickly look at what this mechanism is because it has some relation to the blackout also. Uh, in fact, we, after the blackout, they changed the UI system. They have changed the range. Okay. Still it is there, but they have narrowed down the range. Okay. So what does it contain? Like we in each region, they are taking power from central pool. Suppose there are nine states, they are taking power from central pool. So it is like a day ahead settlement. The regional load dispatch center will take the demand from various states and they take the availability of generators every hour from the central pool and then they will allocate. There is a formula for that. And that becomes the baseline. So they have to pay the capacity charge and energy charge based on that. Now, any deviation from that committed amount has to be settled with the frequency link on scheduled interchange price. So if frequency is low and you are drawing more, yeah. Is there a locational component to the? No, location is not added here, it is flat. Yeah. Actually, we are going to add the locational component. <coughs> so this is the price we charge. We link to the diesel generator price, which keeps on varying. 2012, it was rupees nine per unit and then as the frequency is, goes better the price you have to pay for overall is less whereas if you are overdrawing and frequency is low then you have to pay more now this has a lot of impact in the beginning 2002 and 3 it was introduced and next year the frequency came within a narrower band not perfectly 50 but compared to earlier years where it was exceeding plus minus 1.5 hertz, so it came quite close. So it had positive impact. Now it is there in all the regions. And so if you see here, 49.2, the penalty below 49.2 hertz penalty was seen when blackout took place. And that answers your question. Now it has been brought to 49.7. So there is a high penalty even if the frequency is better, slightly better. So how are those rates updated? Uh, this this rate is fixed, but this is linked to the frequency. So currently, I understand the frequency. It's clear. It's piecewise linear there. But when do they change those those slopes? That depends on the diesel generator price. So this is the diesel generator price is most expensive. So this they fix it for it. Like do they change it every year? Do they change it every no, six months? No, no, no. Every, this was changed after three years. 
Our 2009 was one revision, then 2012, and then our 2014 then we go So it's not that fast. And people like this uh, scheme? Well, some utility may dislike it, uh, but in general they have to follow. This is the regulatory commission's order. But is it effective to uh, to maintain the frequencies? Is it now uh, in a better that band than before? Earlier, earlier it had greater impact, now the impact has slowed down. So there is a talk that now we should go ahead with uh, AGC kind of mechanism, so we may dispense it. I mean, the AGC yeah. could still be there, uh, it would be just a different uh, pricing mechanism. Yeah, so we want to change it. In fact, one of the recommendations in the committee was, I was one of the members of the committee, to review this very carefully and maybe dispense with this. Because this was misused. In the frequency was very nice, and they overdue. Because they were paying very less price. Although there is a care, but they didn't care. So coming to the July blackout, which caused about 350 million people and 670 million people getting affected on two days, and the loss of load was 36,000 megawatt and 48,000 megawatt on the two days. Second day was more severe. So reasonable wise, reason wise, if you see, this is the uh, total amount of distribution of power, these are the inter-regional flows, and northern rate reason was having deficit of generation, so it was worldwide than the scheduled generation. But frequency was 49.68, where they had to pay very less amount for world row. So they did not prefer to go to the exchange and purchase the extra amount of power, they rather preferred to use the UI mechanism. That was one disadvantage of this mechanism. And so Western and Eastern region, they were supporting the Northern region. And that was a very unfortunate day. Lot of lines in the Western region, boundary of the Northern region, went either on forced outages or on, were on scheduled outages, including the interregional interconnection because some of the lines we were upgrading to 65 kV from 400 kV, and that was out. And few lines which were supporting, even 220 kV lines were supporting the flow, they went one by one. Finally, what happened, so if you see the line situation, these are the lines which were out, dotted lines were out. And there were few lines which were connected between Western region and Northern region. And there is a line which is coming from Agra. Agra is famous for Taj Mahal, Gwalior and Meena. That is the one, one line, 400 kV line. Finally, one by one, they tripped because of some fault. And only this line was carrying almost 1400 megawatt, one 400 kV line. The SIL of the 400 kV line is 691 megawatt. Yeah. What's the difference in the color of the line? Oh, the uh, red one is 400 kV, other one is the 220 kV. Yeah. And this one is DC link. Okay. So this was the line. I thought some are always open with the red ones because you can't go there, and the green ones are always closed. No, no, no. Dotted no. ones were open, and the green one was, <laughs> green one was the closed. I mean, the thick line were closed. And this red one is the 400 kV, and green is the. Just so when this line was carrying large amount of power finally at early morning 233, one of the distance relapse production operated because of load encroachment. So it came in the zone 3 production and that operated and that tripped that line. When that line also got tripped, there were few lines, weak lines, because of oscillations between this region and western region, they tripped one by one. And first the western region got disconnected from the northern region. All the power requirement, and they did not reduce their load, despite verbal, there is no automatic control. So despite verbal communication, they did not reduce their load. 
it is started flowing from eastern region so it is like two area system a lot of oscillations you will see and one by one the line strip because the sometime the current became very high voltage became very low so we have seen the tripping under zone 2 and zone 1 also some places so they tripped one by one and finally the northern grade got disconnected from the rest of the grid frequency started dropping here and here the frequency went up that time southern grid was not interconnected they were not synchronized in july 2012 that got synchronized only in 2013 so western eastern northeastern were remained interconnected why they were same you can see we as high as 51 hertz i mean 50 is the nominal frequency they were fortunate some of the generators tripped we don't know the reason actually but they tripped we could verify from the disturbance record and also there were only five six pmus in northern region at that time and five pmus in western region eastern has few pmus that they were, they were not working at that time they had not commissioned at that time so that was the situation we had something like a frequency monitoring system installed one one was installed at it bombay other was in kanpur kanpur comes in northern western region bombay is located uh, that also gave the frequency variation of that region and they matched incidentally so that was on the first day and the pmu plots so wherever you see the sudden variation either it is generator tripping or uh, throw off the load and this is the time when eastern region got also this is the time when western separated from northern this is the time when eastern region got separated from the northern region and northern region was under blackout for almost 14 hours so 350 million people trains were stopped a lot of inconvenience to the people we could also verify from disturbance recorder that, uh, that there was no fault so uh, to verify that it was because of load encroachment so we got the disturbance recorded data we got the pme data we got visited some of the sites and could conclude our findings so that was this is the 30th day so if you see the center of oscillations very interesting here so it was uh, This is this is recorded at the center of oscillation. So some part of western region also remained with the northern region because there was a weak link here, and some part of northern region remained connected to the eastern region, right? So that is how the separation of various regional uh, power was observed. So now. These are, these are the main findings of. So I just wanted to emphasize that we were allowing our the up to thermal limit, the power flow, our operator was allowing up to thermal limit, which was quite high. SIL was surge impedance loading of the line is 691, and the power which was flowing in that line was 1450 megawatt, which is quite high as <coughs> SIL. So immediately it was revised. And then uh, 2.30 was the blackout and about 16 hours afternoon, the power was restored. The Kosoko people were very tired, they were going to sleep, but unfortunate the next day also happened. And it was similar situation. So what happened? Did the system, uh, uh, has it been restored after the first day and then it again, again filled the again. second day? Yeah, so 14 hours in the afternoon, the system was restored on 30th July. 2.30 early morning was the blackout. And then next day, 1.30 in the afternoon, around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, next blackout took place, which was more severe. So they did not know what has really happened on the first day, they restored. They had no way to check. Well, they actually checked the relay, it had operated, they reset. They didn't find any fault, so they synchronized again all the reasons. But there was some difference on that day. The difference was when they resynchronized, 
some of the loads also got reduced and the reason this is the eastern region somewhere here lot of 400 kv lines were taken out because of over voltage they don't have reactors enough reactors to suppress the voltage so lot of lines in this region were tripped and again some of the lines were again taken out for upgradation and this link was weak and they had connected one line and which tripped they don't know what was the reason i think they were maintaining and they wanted to reconnect that also was tripped same thing happened on that day although the real power flow was less but reactive power flow was high on that day. so same bina gwalior agra line tripped on load encroachment separating northern from western but since this part was weak the center of oscillation was somewhere here which separated part of eastern along with western from northern northeastern and major part of eastern region and since western has lot of generators thermal generators they faced deficit of power eastern had surplus but looking at the demand of northern region there were deficit of power there were oscillations between northern eastern and northeastern so one by one these lines strip and northern got separated from eastern their generators stripped on over frequency so second day northern northeastern and majority of eastern region were under blackout so which affected 670 million people but restoration was relatively faster it was in 7 hours compared to 14 hours on the first day so these are the pme plots in fact at one point it was getting synchronized but some generator tripped at this moment <laughs> western reason and then again it separated it could have remained so what we conclude that we could not assess the situation dynamic situation we could not take any corrective action is the horizontal axis what's the time units of the horizontal axis huh? this is 13 hours 00 13.313 second so this is fraction of second oh okay fraction of second yeah fraction of second yeah so they could not assess what is going wrong so then committee actually strongly felt the need of some system which can give dynamic visualization this is the yeah. second day center of oscillations and this part was under blackout so you see here the q flow was high in this and voltage was low and again encroachment of the relay related because of load encroachment and then subsequent firework was there so important observation was that situational awareness was not there we don't have proper monitoring tool then security assessment we cannot make in fact they are going to have dynamic security assessment tool which will be run periodically and then the relay setting was not proper so committee actually recommended that you must go for energy audit production audit of all the relays we have already got <coughs> and then also the how to have a supervisory uh, production so that the unintended operation of zone 2 and zone 3 production is avoided that we are working so reactive power compensation was not enough so we have gone for a lot of SVCs now uh, we have PCSC we had only one SVC in the country that was in our near our institute Kanpur <laughs> 400 kV SVC now we are going ahead with about 19 SVC and they have found the optimum location so wide area monitoring and control was one of the recommendations so power grid is the utility they have actually brought out one document on the roadmap of the uh, synchrophaser deployment and then some of the regulatory changes were required we said that this ui is not good you must narrow down or you must review it so that review is already going on 
and there will be some drastic changes which will be brought out. So, in India actually, till 2013, so at the time of blackout, we had only hardly 15 20 PMUs. Till December 2013, we had 60 PMUs, and the operator got a lot of confidence that it is able to record various disturbances which were, they were not able to understand earlier. <coughs> so the CEO of that company says me that, sir, whenever I see a spike, I don't sleep. I just think that what has happened? What is wrong with the system? So now they are thinking in that way. So they got confidence with this technology. And then government actually forced them to go ahead with a large deployment of PMUs, uh, synchrophaser technology. So very soon we are going to have about 1,700 PMUs covering all 400 kV buses and above voltages and all major generating stations. So first phase, 1700 PMUs will come. And few analytics are being developed. And these are the ones which will come in the first phase, line parameter estimation, oscillation monitoring, vulnerability analysis of distance relay, state estimation, CTPT calibration, CVT calibration, and supervision of zone 3 distance production. So these are already being developed, and now the equipments are arriving, and maybe within a year, it will be deployed. And these are the 60 PMUs which were put across the country in 2013, and there are there is a report which gives you that what kind of experience they have with this particular. Team. This is the architecture of the synchrophaser uh, deployment. So we'll have PDC at different levels. We'll have starting from nodal PDC at substation level, then master PDC at a straight level, regional PDC at five regions, and then national PDC. Of course, we'll have backup for security reasons. So that is the architecture. Are the PMUs owned by the national grid, or are they owned by it the is, regional uh, entities? Uh, no, there is one. Transmission utility, central transmission utility. That is power grid car tracing of India. Right. They are deploying these PMUs. And then finally, so they own the PMUs. They own the PMUs. They own the network. They, share, they share the data with the other uh, regional companies? Or oh, regional, they have they are owner of regional grid also. Oh. They are the owner of regional so, grid. So they can do whatever they want. No, not this class center is owned by the separate company. Or system operation company. So finally, utilization of the data will rest with the RLCs. So, so they will replace. And everybody is participating. It's not that they can play with that. These are some of the work we did at IIT Kanpur, starting from placement, that was earlier work, then state estimation, and a lot of things on stability, transient stability, small signal, voltage, wide area control. And production issues, modeling issues, and we have also set up the VAMS lab using RTDS facility. So the uh, blue one is what I'm going to discuss very briefly. Actually. So this is our uh, synchrophysical lab. Uh, we have six rack RTDS here, so physical PMU, I think you all of you know that how to connect it. You need amplifier and then you need a uh, GT sync card to synchronize to the GPS clock. And then you can bring the data to PDC. We have physical PDC and we also have the software PDC with us. And that is how you can connect and test for various applications. RTDS do have the software PM. So if you want to use only software PM, this, this is the setup we have. You have to have GT SIM card connected to the GPS clock because of synchronizing to the GPS uh, with the internal clock. So various applications we have tested on RTDS. So now dynamic phasor estimation is important in the current context because most of the applications are under dynamic conditions. When 2005, the <coughs> standard came, it only outlined the requirement for steady state operation. But 2011, the major revision came to bring out the requirement under dynamic variations. I'm not talking about few 
microsecond or millisecond where transient period is there, but oscillates, basically oscillates in geometry. So phasor calculation becomes tricky there because fundamental frequency is always changing, not only at one place, every place, and also you have a lot of DC component, multimodal components present. So how to extract the phasor response? So one full thesis is actually worked on dynamic phasor estimation. This Param energy is the PhD student. And if you are interested, these publications you can have. So this is the definition of the phasor under dynamic condition. Both phase and amplitude can vary with respect to time. At a given time instant, that is how you calculate the frequency, looking at the rate of change of phase. And if you add to the nominal frequency, you get the actual frequency at that time. It's not that easy actually. We have to estimate it using some methodology. And then in rectangular coordinate, you can define like that. Now, why it is challenging? These are the typical signals which are present of nominal frequency. Frequency may be ramping down and ramping up. You may have single or multi-mode oscillations present. You may have harmonics present, which may be integral or non-integral. You may have step change of amplitude and phase. DC offset. And while you are monitoring through PMUs, some additional challenges come because of spectral leakage, windowing effect, phase delay and group delay because of anti-aliasing filter, and noise may not be correlated noise. First work which we did was on dynamic voltage phasor estimation. I will not go into mathematics, but give you some idea. Where you, we have used a combination of TLS spirit, total least square estimation of signal parameter through invariance technique and a propagator method. These are signal processing technique, very well known technique. So we found that this gives good accuracy of amplitude estimation. The other one gives good accuracy for phasor estimation. And single data window we have used. And the approach we gave was non recursive so it is fast. And this was published in IEEE transaction instrumentation measurement. And then we have tested for various conditions. And we have also tested for uncertainty defined in GUMS standard and compared with some of the adaptive DFT based method. Uh, this is the multi mode case where uh, frequency and amplitude modulations are there. And if you see the TV value, 1% is acceptable. So if you use only DFT, it doesn't meet the requirement. A spirit method which we have used is giving less than 0.5%. So it is quite accurate. And then ramp test also we did. Frequency ramping at this rate we did. And this is the result we got with DFT, uh, which is slightly higher, quite higher. And here it is very negligible. The TV value we got with our method was quite negligible. Then we created a fault on this new land system and we wanted to know whether it is able to track the waveform or accurately or not. And this is the actual waveform. And this is the tracking by our proposed method. The green one is by our method. And these are the instantaneous value of the voltages. It is very accurately tracking. Now, that was about voltage phasor. Current phasor is more challenging because it has more harmonic components, various types of interharmonics, large oscillations, DC decay. So, we, the earlier method which we tested for voltage phasor did not work well. So, we have gone for, again, TLS spirit, but after finding out what is the model order. So measurement data, which is in discrete form. So we have formed a Hankel matrix and found out its singular values. A log of that have been used to find out current model order, which if you know, you can accurately estimate the current phase. So current phase do require estimation of model order. So, and then subsequently, very interesting work recently we have done. 
not only phasor but first derivative of amplitude and first derivative of phase angle second derivative of amplitude and phase angle if you know it can help you in dynamic assessment and also in predictive application production applications so subsequently we have calculated them and this has brought the rate of frequency error to very low value so this is the demonstration of model order estimation if you see the signal it contains fundamental it contains dc offset so third order and this is the oscillations which is another two five order so till dc offset was there it had given five order model and subsequently it has converts to four order okay so the method actually are very accurate the order this was non integral harmonics again initially it was seventh order then came to sixth order after dc offset and then we have yes, for various test cases which are given in ieee standard we have verified the performance and these are the various cases we simulated for off nominal frequency test along with dc decaying offset and this is our proposed method in fact we use one cycle data as well as two cycle and we reduce some noise and this is the already existing method so we compared which is based on adaptive dft so our tv is much less as compared to the existing method and we also verified for multimodal oscillations which may be present uh, in the system so again the tv is so is there additional computational cost associated with this method compared no, to the No, we method? actually verified uh, it is well within the uh, much less than one cycle value calculation. Yeah. So 20 millisecond is one cycle. It was about two or three millisecond. How long is the conventional method? Pardon? How long does it take to, to compute the phase with the conventional method? Adaptive DFT? Adaptive DFT also is fast. But accuracy is less. In certain cases, it crosses the TV requirement. Yeah, and after DFT is also fast. They are being. How much is it much faster than the method you propose? No, not faster, but more accurate. It is almost same time, but more accurate. Okay. Yeah. And this is the shows the tracking of the actual waveform in 39. Now that is how. So if we can estimate the current and voltage phasor. we can find out the first and second derivative of the phase and the amplitude of the phases so which is a very simple technique so if you know you can expand up to taylor series second order and then if you equate the like powers you can get the first derivative of magnitude second derivative first derivative of phase and second derivative of the phase and then we have performance evaluation because standard doesn't have any requirement for these two quantities so we have evolved this tv calculated from our method and you can also calculate through finite difference like if you know the amplitude at two time instant take the difference divide by time that is d amplitude by dt all right but that is that has certain problem it is not very accurate so this is the uh, tv value we got with uh, for various test cases and we have also compared with finite difference if you see here if frequency is higher then this method gives more much more accurate result as compared to the finite difference method and for rfe calculation actually the limit is 3% of the standard is not 1% and step response also be the tested so at the end it gave a very accurate current phasor estimator voltage phasor estimator rate of change second derivative of the amplitude and phase then we thought why not apply it to prevent blackout or prevent mal unintended operation of the relays so we used the second and first derivative to construct the predicted phasor in advance and then current value which we took actually five cycle away what is the change it has given if that is significant then we say that there is some fault 
if that is not significant, then we say that uh, it is not really a fault. So just to distinguish between fault and no fault scenario, this signal has been used. So this matrix has been used and some threshold have been worked out experimentally. Uh, so again, for unstable swing, stable swing, voltage instability, and other applications we have tested. So this is the case of uh, unstable swing. This is the fault where fault took place. The signal became high and remained up to 0.8 second. And then there is no fault here. So it became zero. But one fault was intentionally created here. Again, it allowed the relay to operate. Okay. And similar thing with voltage instability case. Voltage collapse is taking place. Voltage is declining. And then there is a fault here. So till this time, this method did not allow the relay to operate, and when actual <coughs> it did allow it to operate. Okay. Now the last part I'm going to discuss. I think if you have any question till this point, maybe I can answer, and then this is our work on wide area damping control. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, how is India's grid regionalized? Is it based on geography or uh, network topology? Well, that's a good question. If you visit our National Load Dispatch Center and Regional Load, Regional Load Dispatch Center is Regional Electricity Network only. It is not based on the R. Okay, because yeah. I, I saw the region. This is a map, map on and... which 400 kV lines are shown. And okay. I mean, there is a geographical location, uh, but it is based on that. So 400 kV line, and they are color coded. And they are connected. So, yes. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if I remember well, a week of the blackout uh, that happened in the US, uh, one resolution was to remove the third uh, region for the distance relay. Oh, yeah. So, I see that you still have a three region yeah. for distance but relay. Have you read the paper of part three? John 3 revisited. A paper came in 2010 or so, where he says that we don't, I mean, the recommendation is, is contested. He says that they have certain roles. We should not bypass zone 2 and zone 3 of it. I think earlier, 2003, like our, immediately they bypassed. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. But then it is revisited. Again, it has been dropped. So because, because if we see that paper, uh, it is by 5K and it's grown, John 3 revisited. That is the title of the paper, okay? Very interesting paper. So, you know that every generator is provided with a local control, which is called as PSS, stabilizing control control, apart from the voltage control and frequency control, which is nothing but a lead network which compensates for the lag in the excitation system so that a torque is produced in phase with speed phases. If you have attended any stability mode, this is a very fundamental thing to stop. Okay. Now, how do they calculate the amount of compensation required, <coughs> lead compensation and the gain of compensation? That is based on Mostly it is based on single machine infinite bus representation. Rest of the system is represented as the finite system, and you are calculating <coughs> this parameter for your system. And current operating point they actually selected. The disadvantage is that if the operating point changes drastically, then the parameter you have selected may not be effective in damping the oscillations. So people have gone for retuning, adaptive tuning, and several schemes have been suggested. Now, in the large interconnected system, more than local <coughs> nodes, you are experiencing inter-area inter -area. This kind of control is very effective for local mode, but not that effective for inter-area mode. Not always effective for inter-area mode. That requires tuning of all the controllers. Uh, together. So, after the synchrophaser have been deployed in some of the network, being deployed in several countries, 
it is hoped that we can design a supervisory kind of control to provide wide area picture of the system and also wide area control specifically effective to drive forward the interior <coughs> so there are two architecture one is this decentralized other is centralized what we have worked initially was centralized architecture where we have one controller wide area damping controller getting data from the field which may be power oscillations in the line and giving command to individual excitation system of the generator supplementary controller right over and above the conventional pss so you have conventional pss and you are getting additional signal for effectively damping out the interior oscillations now just imagine it is sitting in one corner of the city and or maybe state and getting data from various places which are several hundred miles away now through communication link and then you are giving command again back to generators which are again far off so what kind of problems you will face one is the delay in the communication although they are time stamped but they are not reaching at the same time and there will be some delay if you use fiber optics the delay may be about 40 milliseconds other technologies will have higher delays okay there is a bpa report on this so that is the one problem now since we are using communication network we may have several other problems packet loss you have sent a packet it is lost packet disorder you have sent a packet earlier but it is reaching to your controller later and latency is always there so there will be some network delay so one has to address these issues to design a effective wide area control apart from selecting a robust control control law proper control law so one of our student have worked in this area and he has suggested some scheme which i am briefly going to present so he initially worked on without looking at the delay and he worked on robust controls so he found that a uh, ts fuzzy controller gives better performance than h2 h infinity which is very popularly used uh, for this particular application for selecting input and output data so if you have wide area control you would not like to monitor all the line data you may have you may have to use only few lines and you have to see under various critical contingency which line is the most vulnerable which has to be monitored so input selection is important and you may not require to send to every generator to regulate their excitation control you may need only few generators to be regulated so proper selection of input and output is also important so there are some techniques which are already existing in the literature one is based on controllability and observability index and the other is called direct <coughs> they are already controls people know that these techniques are used so what we have used which is more effective is a combination of principal component analysis and self organizing so the signature of the power oscillation for few critical contingency have been given to pca to find out principal component and that becomes input to self organizing map to tell you which set of generators and which set of line are the most effective for given modes critical modes that is the key area so we use some dynamic contingency ranking method based on the simple concept change in damping ratio normalized value when you simulate a contingency these are the five top contingency in 39 bus and 68 bus we took the data only for three and they we found that that is good enough and for this is the critical contingency this gave the speed deviation plot and speed deviation principal components we have derived from using pca and that we gave to the self organizing map for finding out which generator is more effective to receive the signal similarly we did exercise for power flow so we got the input and output selection using this methodology and this is with the other two methods existing method geometric approach is based on joint 
controllable to the observability index. And Excuse me. Yeah. What are the limitations or no, reason why you use sometimes 29 buses and 68 buses? Pardon me? Why? You. I saw that uh, in your simulation you use sometimes the 29 bus and the 68 bus. Uh -huh. Why you use the both? What are the limitations? What are the? The limitations of. Uh, no, no, it was tested for both the systems. Both systems. Both the system, and we have also tested for northern regional grid also. I'm just trying for a uh, few reasons only. And uh, from the engine uh, power grid, when you try to uh, study this in your lab, uh -huh. Do you reduce this to how many buses? Well, if you are talking about the physical simulation, not RTDS. Non RTDS simulation, we can uh, test any size of the system. We have BSSE, we have forward, which can take 1,000 buses, well, like, oh, sorry, 100,000 buses. So we can we can simulate. But RTDS has limited. Yes. RTDS, we have six rack, and each rack can have 24 into 3, that is the 96 buses. So 96 into 6 is the size we can take. Three phase buses. But it all depends on uh, the details of the controller also. If you are going detail control model, the number of buses will be used. Yeah. We have PB5 processes. <coughs> PB5? Yeah. Okay. Three per rack. So then input output selection was done and then controller was designed and then performance was tested compared with other input output selection techniques. It gave better result. Now delay compensation, again we took the advantage of synchrophasic data. Synchrophasic has time is time. And your controller location also if you have GPS clock. So you can know that how much delay has taken for this particular phase of data to arrive. That is a simple concept. But that really doesn't help. So you have to find out what would have been the current situation of the power oscillation. Like this data was 30 milliseconds earlier. But what would have been the power flow at the current moment? We used modified EKF for model estimation and then from there we predicted the response. So time delay through GPS clock and time step and then modified EKF for model estimation and then we reconstructed for the present time. And there were some techniques like chronological sequence was used, sort algorithm was used for package disorder. So all the issues we had addressed. This is the diagram. And if you see here, this is the delay compensator. So this is GPS clock. This is the time stamp. You know the time delay. And then EKF gives the modes. And using this, the delay compensator signal can be constructed. Okay, and then we have tested for again 3968. This is the diagram for 39, where some fax controller were also considered. And this is the random delay we applied. Packet drop also we simulated random packet drop, random packet delay, and we verified whether it is matching with the current PMU output or not. <coughs> Closely matching, and then controller performance was verified it gave best result. And then finally, it was tested of RTDS. So RTDS, our controller is sitting in this computer. Our phase data compens uh, concentrator, which is open source I, uh, I PDC software, was in another computer. And then the, we had, we have limited number of PMUs. So few places we have connected to the physical PMUs to get the data, that is line flow data, and we have soft PMUs inside RTDS. So they were brought to phase data concentrator, and one NI card we used to give the feedback signal 
to the generator excitation system. Generator excitation system. And we had written a program to create time delay, disorder, packet drop. Okay. So this was tested in our lab. And this the actual and feedback signal were almost matching the slight difference. This is the random delay which was introduced. And this is the performance of our control. So there is slight difference in only simulation and hardware in loop simulation because of the different models used in MATLAB and RTDS. Slight difference is there. But if you don't use YDD damping controller, then it gives very poor response. So just to conclude, I think I took slightly more time. Well, synchrophaser based technology is going to be popular in electricity grid, at least in transmission network for the time being. But I'm sure if your scope will span to distribution network, but you have to develop low cost PMUs, micro PMUs, and so on. I believe there are some are going on in various parts in the US. Because when the renewable integration is increasing, maintaining stability becomes very, very challenging. New type of oscillations you will observe. I was sharing my experience with somebody that our southern grid is having a lot of wind power. Plant. And PMU we started observing a very unusual frequency. And then we simulated. We found that there is a voltage oscillation always present, uh, which is of the 10 hertz frequency. So you will find new phenomena there. So it will become very challenging. So Situational awareness, dynamic condition monitoring becomes important as you are going for more renewables, as you are going for more interconnections, large size interconnections. And then you can build upon various control and protection of the patients. So, but success of such technology is possible only when you have proper analytics. I'm sorry that I present. We don't have any standard analytics for a particular application. That is still being worked out. And that is where I think our pool of academics from different places can collaborate and develop some proper analytics, which can be tested in different platforms across the world. Okay. So thank you very much. I think these are some of the thoughts I wanted to share. Quick question. Yes, you mentioned micro PMUs. Uh, where do you, how would you see those being used in some of these cases, whether it's? Not yet it has been used, but I see the need of micro PMU because, see, accuracy requirement in distribution may not be very high, which you need at transmission level. But cost is most important. So you have to have low cost here. So I believe some of the universities in the US is developing. One of my students is excited to develop something, but we never know. They may take up a job and go somewhere else. That is the end of the dream. So we wanted to develop this. We're, we're actually working on it too. Um, in, in this group, I'm helping with one. Um, but they're both looking at basically residential voltage uh, and looking at very similar challenges to our, as far as the algorithms and things like that. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. But you don't need a very complex work there. Yeah. Because of the not very strict regulation. So micro PME, you have to evolve some other stuff. You cannot be the same thing. Yes. You can pose, pose it in mist. Mist is We've been using the same standard, the not means a nasty. Some of the nasty meeting you can close it. You can have working group. I'm uh, sure you have some. Yeah, uh, Professor, when you receive uh, PMU data from utility. Uh -huh. From utility. Yeah. yeah, what you do with the, how do you data mining those data? No, right now we are not we are not getting data from utility. We are generating in all that. Yeah, but one project we approved right now, I was in the advisory committee, where utility person was also there. He said that, I will give you data 
uh, you demonstrate this application. Uh, they basically wanted, I think, voltage distributed this voltage distributed For that reason, more they are seeing a lot of voltage problems. So they will connect. Actually, there is no difference. It's in your lab, you are taking data from RTDs, which will be replaced by the data from utility. Data from utility. Okay. So you can do all the analytics in your lab. That is possible. Your request was data as a CSV file, or it's coming under the uh, KMU uh, format. No, data, whatever. We are not actually getting any data. Right now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Can you just mention for the for the main case? Um, so if you observe some like low frequency oscillation. What do you do about that? Is there a really you have to design the controller to help it out. Is that like really like bad for the system performance? I mean, no. Yes. Yeah. Uh, even though it's HBO like. No, it is eight to ten hertz, which is not angular, angular okay. oscillations. It is voltage oscillations. Uh, so voltage oscillation is also bad. So you have to damp it. One of my new students is working on that. New PhD student. I mean, even though the, the oscillation will eventually convert to yeah. zero. So if you use something like Skycom or SVC with some stabilizing control, uh -huh. it will come. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, so you're installing about 700 PMUs. So is yeah. there like a task force who's going to handle, I guess? Well, there was an international advisory committee form which deliberated for two years to come to this stage. Uh, Professor Farke himself from Virginia Tech was the chairperson. And there were uh, utility people who were deployed from US and Europe. And two professors from IT system. One was myself, other was from IT Bomb. And they came out with the roadmap. They came out what are the analytics required for in this scenario right now. Who will develop? So yeah, some some thought has been given here, how to we will go ahead. And there is a monitoring also of this thought. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Can you say something about KMU monitoring in a control room? What format we can work for monitoring the PMU data? They have taken visualization software from G or something. I think control room they have taken from G or something. I'm not in memory. But as come is now supplying on the whole system. Visualization software. In fact, if you are interacting with Southern California, <coughs> they have a very nice system, I think, developed by somebody who sells. Because I attended one last meeting, he always tells about the visualization system the company has formed. So, yeah, you need visualize, good visualization tool, historian and good visualization tool. Okay, I hope it was useful to all of you. Go. <laughs> I think I recorded okay. After that, I didn't realize that, that it wasn't dragged onto the desktop. So then when we took that out, it, it lost it. There's there's the little lid here. I'm leaving PDF of my presentation. So if you want, you can take it. No problem. So if anybody wants, you sure. can share. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sit and we'll have the uh, <laughs> video on our website. I do not advise. Nothing. Yes. <laughs>